Has Eddie Howe not done a better job than what Patrick Vieira has? Oh, don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the producer Charlie set you up or something. <laughs> yeah, no, you, as things stand right now, I'm going to go with Vieira. All right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think D, D threatened me before the show, by the way. <laughs> way. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, Callum, but I think it's cities, cities again. Yeah, sorry, right, Chris, I'm, I've got that I'm note. I'm not going to sit here. And just like, I'm going to be really selfish. I want more Northern teams in the Premier League. <laughs> these, these are weird games down at the bottom end of the country. I swear to God. <laughs> The mentality of the squad is not right, and you have to have a clear up. It would just just sit to sit down, have that chance to, to just just chat football with Sir Bobby Robson. I don't think anyone would come close. Like I've got a little one, and his name isn't Stevie, but I call him Stevie. Like I get, <laughs> Why would I get that? that's normal. <laughs> You're punishing, but I feel like personally, Patrick Vieira was that. I knew, I knew I'd get a bite. <laughs> Hello, lovely people, and welcome back to episode 14 of the Fan Zone, the Premier League talk show for the fans by the fans. And delighted to be joined today by Crystal Palace fan D from Back of the Nest, Newcastle fan Chris from Galloway Gate Shots, and my name is Callum from Team Coppish. How are you guys doing today? Yeah, good. We've got a big week coming up, so just, just getting ready for that, really. Um, apart from that, it's, it's all fine. Forget about the Premier League, but yeah. I mean, it's a Premier League talk show, but forget about it for, for <laughs> at least after this, I'll forget about it for a bit. Well, you might forget about it, but let's be honest, there's only one place to start. Maybe I'm a little bit biased being a Liverpool fan, but Liverpool versus Manchester City happened yesterday and was a great game for the neutral. My heart is still coming down in terms of beats per second, etc. But I want to ask you guys, is this the best rivalry in Premier League history? Uh, I'll go with you first, Chris. No, in a word. Um, <laughs> far from it, I would say. I, I think, looking at the game yesterday, there was a lot of respect between the two teams, between the two managers. Rivalry, for me, is back when you're looking at Man United v Arsenal. Them sort of went, when you Those two going in the game, there was blood and sweat left on the pitch there. And yes, two fantastic teams in Liverpool and City. But for me, when it comes down to rivalry, you can't get past the likes of Keane versus Vieira. Keane in there, you, you can't look past that for me. Mm. It depends um, on how well, you look at it, though. Yeah. Because if you look at it like that, Chris, without a doubt, then I feel like you're 100% correct. I feel like even Manchester United, Man United against Liverpool, against Arsenal, like there, there used to be some tense rivalry off and on the pitch. But when you look at the football, I genuinely feel like... You know, there's a stat out there with Liverpool and Manchester City. Only one point have separated them so far. I think in the last you know, three to five years, I'm not too sure exactly the duration of time. But the style of football and how close it is in terms of rivalry, I feel like right now in the era that we're having between Manchester City and Liverpool, it's up there. But if you're looking at all the other factors involved off the pitch and what rivalry means to you, then 100% you look at the previous eras. But if you're talking about football alone, I feel like this era is something else. Like, we're talking about one point separating teams, even right now, when we're talking only one point separate them, for the last how many years? And it just shows how competitive it is. But as you said, off the field and even on the field right now, when you talk about rivalries, they're too nice to each other. They're, they're bigging each other up too much. But when you look at the quality on the pitch, I think it is a healthy debate to have, especially right now between Manchester City and Liverpool. So, obviously, being a Liverpool fan, I might be a little bit biased here. But I've got to be honest, I I think Liverpool and Man City need to have one more season of competitiveness between them. And then I think we have the conversation. I think as things stand right now, not just yet. Because the Arsenal-Man United rivalry lasted quite a long time. Even though the quality kind of diminished towards the end. But if you look at since sort of 17-18 when the rivalry began between Liverpool and City... You've got the Champions League games. You've got the 4-3 at Anfield. You had the 5-0 at the Etihad where they absolutely smashed us when, when that's 10 men. Then 18-19 where it took up a level. They beat us by a point. 19-20, we then smashed them. Then last season, they smashed us. And then now we're back and neck and neck. Can't separate the two teams in two games so far this season. Playing each other in the, champ sorry, in the FA Cup. Many people expect us to play each other in the Champions League in the final. 
So again, it, I think if we get past this season and we play each other in the FA Cup and the Champions League, and then next season we have another run at it, then I think we have a conversation. But speaking about these two teams again, guys, obviously one point separating it, as you both said, who wins this league? Um, bear in mind, you know what team I support, guys. <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 sorry, but I, I think it's City. I, I, I honestly think it's going to be City that's going to nab it. I think I'll go right till the end. I really do. Hmm. But I, I'm I'm sorry, Callum. But I think it's City's City's again. Yeah, so right, Chris, I'm, I've got that I'm not going to sit here. And just be like, <laughs> you know what, Callum? I feel bad for you. It's going to be Liverpool. <laughs> it's going to be City. Let's be honest here. <laughs> There's only one winner in this. But it is going to be tight. And I actually like the score yesterday in terms of the draw because for neutral, just looking at the title race, every game means a lot. Even before, even let's say Manchester City won or Liverpool won, of course, every game means a lot. But now it's just one point and it's like a final stretch. Seven games to go, they're going to face each other in the FA Cup as well. You've got the Champions League. It's about who can be consistent for 90 minutes. It's all about 90 minutes of finals. And both teams can do it. But for me, I think in terms of edging it, I think City will do it. But it is going to go down potentially to the last day. I don't think City is going to do it a week before, two weeks before. I feel like City might drop points and then Liverpool might drop points. I feel like there's a potential for both of them to happen. And on the final day... It's going to be decided, but I think City edges it for me. But Callum, I think, I you, think you, Callum. Be, you have to back your boys. Yeah, um, I'll be honest. I think both teams will drop points between now and the end of the season. I do think we'll pit them to it by one or two points, though. Ooh. I do. I know. I, I just I just think we will, especially if they stay in the Champions League as well. I think it because, again, City's squad is fantastic, but they haven't got the biggest of squads. They have a they have a good size squad, but because of the versatility of a lot of their players, it seems like their squad's actually bigger than what it is. I think as we start progressing further on into the later stages of FA Cup, Champions League, and obviously the Premier League, I think we may just pip it. I think we're at a point where we're similar to a penalty shootout now, where you go in the last handful of games now and you're thinking it's the first team to, to mess up, really, to make those errors and drop points. And, and like they said, that, that result for a neutral... 2-2 two, two and both walking away with the point there. It, it, it's fantastic for us looking from the outside in because there's nothing worse when the Premier League's decided four or five games before the end of the season. Same with the likes of the relegation battle at the other side. Mm. But for me, if, if that goes into the last game of the season and obviously I'm sat here comfortable not worried about my team. Dee's <laughs> sat there not worrying about his team. You can just enjoy what is going to be happening on that last game. Exactly. Should we talk about? Should we continue to talk about rivals and talk about rivals? Um, talk about a team that's been struggling so far this season, and that's Manchester United. Is reported that um, Eric Ten Hag is going to be their next manager. And my question is: Is he the right man for Manchester United? Are Man United going to go back to the old form, which has been about nearly ten years, and actually compete for titles? Is he going to be the man, guys? Um. I mean, I pray and hope Man United never get back to where they were. Um, I quite like them how they are now. Um, but I mean, I, I actually rate Ten Hag really highly as a manager. I think the problem for Man United, as we've seen, is regardless of the manager, it's it's the people above the managers. I think Ralph Ragnick being in the role he's going to be in from next season is going to have a vital role to play. But again, it's whether or not he's going to be trusted to do what needs to be done. We've seen the likes of them signing Paul Pogba, Cristiano Ronaldo and, and these types of players who on paper are brilliant and they bring that Marcus Billy, the commercial value. But why not go and get a player who's less well known about who will actually go and do the job that you need to do so that team can thrive? And I think that's the problem with Man United over the last few years. Are they going to catch City, Chelsea and Liverpool next season? Maybe not. But I think with the right appointments, recruitment, I think with the star that Ten Hag likes to play and implement, I think they can potentially bridge the gap on top four next season. But I don't think they'll be challenging for honours next season unless they have a massive mega clear out in the summer, which I don't think will happen. Mm. I, I honestly don't think there is a right man for the job. It, it depends. They had this debate in the studio, one of the Man United games a couple of weeks ago, about who's going to come in and who can change this Man United team around. 
everybody's looking at Man United as if for this team where the winning trebles, the winning consecutive Premier League titles, it's been a long time since that ever happened. So mm. we're, we're talking about the right man for the job. What is success for Man United at the minute? Or are they going to go into next season looking at, they're going to challenge for the Premier League, say a day? Because obviously that's where everybody wants to be at the end of the day. Mm. I 100% agree. With Manchester United, I, I mentioned title there, but personally, as a neutral, just looking at it, I don't think even title should be in a discussion next season. For a club like Manchester United, I understand it to a certain extent because Manchester United should be competing for the title. I'm not saying winning it every season, but competing. And they haven't really done that in consecutive seasons. It, it, it's a struggle. But for Manchester United, for them to actually get to that stage, they need to fix the problems with the squad, as you mentioned, Callum, as well. You know, mm-hmm. there's there's problems with this mentality of the squad. It seems like they're trying to sack a manager that's that's interim. He's not even meant to be there full time. I don't even understand what they were doing in the Everton game. Like it seemed like they weren't playing for the manager, and he's gonna go there. He's gonna go after six games. So the mentality of the squad is not right, and you have to have a clear up. I don't think Ten Hag coming in is gonna change everyone. Everyone's gonna be winners all of a sudden. There's some, there's just some players there that are not going to cut it at Man United. They've been there too long. They haven't proven themselves. So you have to get rid of them players. I think realistically, next season for Manchester United, top four should be the minimum requirement. I still feel like they will be. They should be able to achieve that. But in terms of title, in terms of rebuild, it will take time. It depends on how much he gets backed. But I feel like going forward, he might be the right man. He might. I don't want to say he is, but he might be the right man depending on how he adapts to the Premier League in terms of whether the club actually lets in Hog do his thing in terms of getting rid of some players, bringing in his own players. So it's a big if, but I feel like there is potential there. You just have to give it time, which right now, of course, Manchester United fans, they're impatient for the right reason because they've been struggling. They've been struggling and they want a team that should be competing there to win. I think the issue which you have with Man United now and next season is that you're going to have teams around them that that are going to be in this same rebuild sort of thing. Um, And Man United, their worry isn't finishing in top four. I don't think it is. I think it's not letting the teams underneath them overtake them. Because I honestly think that's going to happen. I, I really do. Um, I, I, like you say, the, the gap between um, City, uh, Liverpool, Chelsea, Spurs, Arsenal, uh, you've already got five ahead of them. So they're, they're going to struggle. They, they really are. I think it's it's going to take more than one man to change that team. And like you said, they, they, you're looking at a, a, a overhaul of that full squad. The likes of Pogba in there, you, you need to stop looking at these marquee signings and just bring in Decent footballers in that can do a job, not to sell shirts. Bring somebody in that's mm. gonna get you higher up in that league without selling shirts. That that's that's a problem, Man United at the minute. It's all all commercialized, and that's all that it has been for a long time. And I can't see it changing anytime soon. Yeah, same. Um, they they remind me of sort of how Liverpool were to an extent before Klopp came in. The difference with and and here's the thing though. The people above Klopp, they kind of just said, look, if you want a player, then you go and get that player. Whereas, again, mm. as you both alluded to, the whole commercialization of Man United, we don't know if that's going to be allowed. And if that's not going to be allowed and they keep on signing these quote-unquote marquee names who don't have the substance needed for a rebuild, then they're always going to be in this position and they're going to be lacking going forward. Yeah. That- so I'm going to bring the topic back to managers since we'd started on managers. Okay, <laughs> so currently only a handful of games left in the Premier League. Who is getting your pick for manager of the season? I'm going to come to you, Colin, because um, I know what Dave's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's four names in this for me. And they've all changed throughout the season. And I think I, I, I won't be able to make a decision until the end of the season. But the four names that really ring out to me is Arteta, Moyes, Vieira and Bruno from, from Wolves. I think you look at the job Arteta's done, he came in a lot of criticism in the first month of this season. Spent 150 mil, bought players like Aaron Ramsdale, who collectively were written off by the whole football community. And they are battling for top four, which I think is them overachieving. Now, the problem is with Arteta is because they had it in their hands and now it's not in their hands anymore, it could seem as though he's flopped the season when in reality the expectations have just changed throughout the season for him Mm -hmm. so i think if they can get top four this season then for me he'd be manager of the year for Vieira now he's had to go into crystal palace and completely reprogram that machine because 
Hodgson ball is very difficult to get out of your system. Believe me, I know. I've been there myself. And he's gone in there and just completely refreshed that whole squad. You look at players like Elise, Zaha looks like he's had a new lease of life. Conor Gallagher's now going to go back to Chelsea and people are going to be expecting big things of him. Like They just look like a really good team and they absolutely battered Arsenal last week. So again, that doesn't happen by accident. That is them knowing their knowing their job and how to implement their, their system. Bruno at Wolves has had a bit of a crazy season because they don't concede loads, but they don't score loads either. So they're kind of in that middle ground at the moment where you think if sort of Jimenez had scored a few more goals, they'd probably be higher up the table. But at the same time, the owner shouldn't just be on him to score. So maybe Fabio Silva need a bit more goals from him, need a bit more from him. Um, but I think next season, Wolves will be an even better team to watch and be a harder team to play against. And then Moyes with West Ham. Two seasons in a row, they've quietly been in and around the Europa League places. They progressed quite far in the Europa League already this season. And it seems as though they might get a Europa spot again this season. If they do that again, we've got your take your hat off to, to David Moyes. So those are the four names from me. But who do you pick? <laughs> you pick four. <laughs> 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 As things cool. stand right now, I'm going to go with Vieira. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, look, in, all honesty, in all honesty, I think D, D threatened me before the show, by the <laughs> way. <bro. laughs> look, I'm gonna say, look, the easy answer will be Vieira, but I want to give a shout out to David Moyes as well because with Arteta, what's happened this season is um, yes, he's done a fantastic job in terms of even competing for the top four. I'm not too sure if they'll finish here because they've had two results that's that's gone against them, but it's not about the two results, it's about the players that they have. I mean, we're talking about inexperienced players. It's, it's a lot of youth players. And it seems like the result against us has impacted them. Then the result against Brighton has. I feel like the pressure is mounting up to them. And I don't know if they'll be able mm. to succeed. So I don't know if they'll finish top four. But regardless, he's still done a fantastic job with Arsenal this season, as Callum has said. Um, but for me, I think he has to go down to... I want to say Vieira and I want to say David Moyes at the same time. Because the reason why I think David Moyes is up there is because, yes, they might not finish in the top four. And they might even drop down to seventh. But you have to put into context that they're, they're fighting in, in the European competition. Um, mm. They're still up there. They still have a chance of finishing fifth or, I don't think, fourth, fourth is between Tottenham and Arsenal for me personally. But he's done a fantastic job. It's not like he's had, you know, they still they gave him, you know, some, some new players as well. But he's done good with the players that he's got. And I feel like all around, all season long, West Ham, you know, we've been talking about top four. We've been talking about United, Arsenal, and also the other teams that's been up there, um, Tottenham as well. But West Ham, it seemed like they got ignored all the way through the season. And we got used to them being so high up the table from early on and being consistent that it doesn't really get mentioned as much. But I feel like West Ham have done a fantastic job, especially David Moyes with the plays that he's got. So for me, I want to say David Moyes, but he has to be Patrick Vieira um, <laughs> because he changed the whole mentality around the club. But David Moyes has done a fantastic job. And sometimes I feel like he goes a bit unnoticed because we're so used to it due to how they've done all season long. I'm, I'm going to throw my point across, right? So, currently looking at the Premier League table, D, how many points are Crystal Palace sat on? Uh, 37. How many points are Newcastle United sat on? <laughs> oh, don't do this. I mean, 34. Has 34 all that points. 34 points, just one win behind Crystal Palace. Has Eddie Howe not done a better job? The one Patrick Vieira has. Oh, don't do this. Chris. <laughs> the, 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 the producer Charlie set you up or something. <laughs> Mate, no, you, you, no, you're no, talking man. about the mentality I'll, of a football I'll, club changing. I'll tell I you what. Thinking about it. I was thinking about it. I was thinking about when I was looking at the league table and I was looking at Newcastle. I think Eddie Howe's done a fantastic job. And I guess you do have a point because it, just because he had all like the money spent in January, it doesn't mean that it's guaranteed success. And he's done a fantastic job, but Vieira did spend in the summer, I 100% agree with that. But, you know, with Eddie Howe and what happened in January and look at how much you guys have spent, it's kind of, it was not maybe expected, but, like, if he struggled with that, then he will be, like, one of the worst. Like, how, how on earth can he struggle when you brought in all them plays? And even before that, you had a bit of time to implement your system. So, for me personally, when you look at consistency all season long, with Palace, I mean, Eddie Howe was with you guys in FA Cup when you guys got knocked out, right? 
Um, so you saw uh, that. Yes. So, yeah, he was. I was big there. Well, you talk about spending money in January. Um, we had just bought our English right back, England's current right back, Kieran Trippier, involved in that game. Yeah, I mean, we got England's, we got England's future left back involved, involved as well when you're talking about development. So, but I feel like personally, Patrick Vieira, what is that? I knew, I knew of, I'd get a bite. Exactly, in terms of competing for the top 10, Patrick Vieira has done that. We're, we're competing. We might not finish top 10. We're competing for top 10 and we're going to pick up semi finals. Eddie Howe, unfortunately, maybe next season, but. But yeah. this season, I don't think he can be involved. I feel like other managers have done. But you know what? He's done a good job so far. But I feel like he's done a brilliant job. Arteta's done a, you know, done a good, tremendous job all season long. To give him a serious answer, um, it, it's a shame um, Brighton have dropped down there. To, to be fair, because because Brighton were doing fantastic at the start of the season. I think Green Potter would have been at the top of this discussion if they yeah. had been yeah, mm. obviously a little bit higher. The, the current eleventh there, um, they they were top six for a long time at the start of the yeah. season. Um, so that's a shame that they've dropped down there. But for me, I'm going to go David Moyes. Mm, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Because I, I honestly feel like he gets slept on. He gets slept yeah, on by does. other people. Because like as I, as, I, as I said, like David Moyes has done a fantastic fantastic job. West Ham, and I understand they're a big club. But for, for them to be so high up there all season long, normally you see teams start off well. And then they yeah. drop off. They haven't really dropped off. They've had some results here and there that's been a struggle, but they've still managed to keep up there, which shows how good they've been all season long. So if you pick David Moyes over Vieira, I don't blame you because uh, potentially. Well, I, I think Eddie Howe over Vieira. Well. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I think Eddie Howe over Vieira. Well. Oh, jeez, Eddie Howe over Vieira. Eddie Howe. <laughs> <laughs> if Vera has, has all the money to spend, just like Eddie Howard, then trust me, right now, Newcastle will be competing for the top four. <laughs> but speaking about Newcastle, and obviously them being safe now under Eddie Howe when it didn't look like it would be when he came in, the championship race is really hotting up. But I'm going to ask you both. If there were two teams you'd like to see come up from the championship, who would it be and why? So, Chris, I'm going to start with you on this one. Uh, Forest, straight in there. Um, I'm gonna be really selfish. I want more northern teams in the Premier League. <laughs> these these are way games down at the bottom end of the country. I swear to God, we're already losing one in Burnley by the looks of it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it, we need the northern teams up there just <laughs> save the train fares down to London. I'll tell you that. Uh, you know what? I don't blame you because I was actually thinking the same. Like, all, like I don't want to. I'm I'm. In a way, apart from um, Joe from Turf Class Podcast, Burnley going down is a delight for me because traveling up there is a problem. So I want Luton <laughs> to get up there, but not Luton in terms of just the travel because Luton is close to London. But Luton is a club that you know I've, I've read about it and they've had their struggles, but for them mm. to actually be in a Premier League is something different. We've seen Bournemouth in the Premier League, we've seen Fulham as well in the Premier League, and both of them teams getting promoted. I wouldn't mind that personally for away travel reasons because it's not that far away. But in terms of actual size that I want to see, I think Luton is just the one that I really want them to get promoted because it's something different. When when have we lost or ever heard of Luton Town being in the top side? Like, I, I can't remember it. And, you know, it's it'll be something different from the Premier League and it'll be exciting. Like, even look at the ground. It's... <laughs> I mean, it's it's a completely different ground to what you normally see in terms of you have to go through mm. houses at some point to go and enter the ground. It's imagine that Ch like Chelsea played already, but imagine week in week out, Luton. It's, it's something something about that club that I want to see them get promoted. Fair enough. Um, if I'm gonna be selfish, I'm gonna go Fulham. Um, we've we've seemed to build up a nice little relationship with Fulham recently with some of the transfers we've made, whether it be Harvey Elliott, Fabio Carvalho recently. Uh, we've loaned them Nico. So hopefully we can have a nice little relationship. Plus they're a London team as well. The, the other team is not in a forest for me again, though, because just nostalgia and the, the European pedigree they've got, you, you want to see a team like that in the Premier League again. It's been years, it's what, the, it's, since the 90s since they've been in the 90s, Premier League. Yeah, so, yeah I'd, I'd really like to see Nottingham Forest back up. So Nottingham Forest and Fulham would be my two. Yeah. So one gonna... one club that you're thinking when you you look back at the like your your Merlin and your Panini sticker albums and things like that 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 Forest Crest. Man, it's been a long time, yeah, been a long time since we've seen that. 
Yeah. yeah, and they've done well in FA Cup as well. So, like, yeah. again, top side. So, they seem like they are ready for the challenge. So, bring just, them up. Just to go back to Fulham as well. Um, obviously, last time, Mitrovic, ex Newcastle United player. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing if Mitrovic has changed when it, when it comes to Premier League football. He, he's absolutely on fire. There's no question about that uh, for yeah. Fulham. And I'm really looking forward to seeing if, if he can do it in the Premier League. Mm. Yeah. We're well, talking about nostalgia. And talking about, you know, in terms of we want Nottingham Forest up. If you could have one person from the Premier League history as your ultimate dinner guest, who would it be? We can open up. They can be dead or alive. Who do you guys want to sit with and why? For me, it's, it's got to be Stevie. Stevie Gerrard, man. It's just, he's he's my hero. Like, like I've got a little one and his name isn't Stevie, but I call him Stevie. Like I get, Why would you I get do that? that's normal. <laughs> you're punishing. You're punishing. You're punishing the guy. Um, if, it's a, if it's a guy, um, if it's a kid, it's a big boy. You're punishing him. I mean, he doesn't want to be remembered from a from a legend that slipped the Premier League title. Right? <laughs> See, he's only remembered like that by rival fans. Steven Gerrard for me is that guy where if he wasn't at Liverpool Football Club growing up, I genuinely think we'd be a mid-table team, if not lower. He saved us. He saved us as a club on the football pitch. Like, we owe him a lot. Never got to lift that Premier League trophy, unfortunately, but he never had the right to because we never had a squad capable of winning it under the time he was playing. Put Gerard in this current team in, in Klopp, then we win everything. Like, the quadruple isn't even a conversation, in my opinion. Gerard is that worldly. But, yeah, for me, I'd love to sit down and, and like, have a, a, a dinner guest with Gerard. Like, that'd be, oh, that'd be the dream. Chris, what was what was saying? Newcastle player, or are you going something a bit different? It's it's a no brainer from me. Uh, being Newcastle United fan, it, it's all if you having this conversation. God knows how many times you get asked this question, especially as football fans. Um, for me, it's going to be Sir Bobby Robson all day long. It's not just Premier League history. It, this is football and history. Uh, a manager who is well respected, not not just as a manager, as a player, and just. As a, as a gentleman, he really is. Um, everybody knows the, the name and some of the stories that Sir Bobby would have to tell would, would be phenomenal. I, I don't think there's, there's anybody that comes close in regards to some of the things that Bobby Robson would have seen over his days. And, and I'm not even saying that just as, as a Newcastle United supporter. I just look at the Barcelona days, managing Ronaldo, so, some of the best footballers that the world has ever seen. It would just, just sit to sit down, have that chance to, to just... Just chat for Paul with Sir Bobby Robson. I don't think anyone will come close. Mm. For me, I'm yeah. going to go something different. I'm not going to pick a Palace player uh, or ex-manager. I'm just going to go for Mario Balotelli in his peak <laughs> as well. I think that would be just absolutely amazing. We'll have dinner <laughs> one second, next second. Fireworks might be exploding. That's the kind of thing I want. Something exciting. Forget about this whole story. Just stuff. I just want to have fun with Mario Balotelli. I've actually um, watched and listened to... Um, one of his interviews recently, and there was that mis, um, like the, the, the misconception about Maribel Telly being this type of uh, person and how the media portrayed him like that. But some of the stuff he did do, there's no denying that. And Maribel Telly at his peak, oh, love it. We, we can sit at dinner for one one minute and then afterwards go and have some fun. Like, God knows where Maribel Telly will bring me. So Maribel Telly is my option. Um, just a wild card. I absolutely love him. In his peak, especially, you're like 19 years old. That Maribel Telly there, I mean, He's still done his thing on the pitch, but off the pitch as well. That was just wild. I don't know how he done it. Fair enough. Shout. Good shout, to be fair. Good shout. Yeah, I'm, I'm not is. sure if it'll go down well if, if all three are in the room at the same time. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure that'll go down well, but <laughs> we'll never know, will we? <laughs> that would be fun. Well, guys, let us know in the comments below who would be your fantasy dinner date. Um, but that does wrap it up for episode 14 of The Fan Zone. Please do drop us a like if you've enjoyed this episode. And guys, let's be honest, even if you haven't enjoyed it, go on, just, just give us a like anyway. Drop your comments below about some of the things that we've discussed and subscribe to this channel for more content in the future. Before we go though, D, where can the people find you to support you? Back of the Nest on uh, YouTube um, and Twitter, everywhere else. And then I've got my personal Twitter as well, at the Palace, um, if you want to see me ramble on about why I married Palatelli. Is a better player because he's nah. I'm joking. A better player than Steven Gerrard because he's actually won a Premier League trophy, unlike certain legends. But um, yeah, you can find me on back of the nest. <laughs> Chris, where can the people find and support you, bro? 
Same as Dick Stray on Twitter and YouTube. Uh, all your podcast providers. Just search for Gallagher Shots and you get umpteen amount of podcasts from myself and the rest of the lads. Yeah, that's about it from us. And you can find me at Callum Sanderson or at Team Coppish across all of our social media. So that has been us, guys. Hope you enjoyed. Until we see you next time. Thank you for watching. Take care.